what does it call you? Okay. My uh my moniker, right? Yes, sir. You can go ahead and say your first name as well. Yeah, is that right, it's Jonathan Navila and uh I used to be Noxter or Knox, K N O X. Where are you incarcerated for and how long is your sentence? Okay, um my charges are uh first degree murder and uh three counts of attempted murder, uh two counts of assault and uh, uh all, the, all for the benefit of a gang. And my complete sentence was eighty one years to life. Where are you from right here on the streets? From Southgate, California. Do you or did you belong to any type of gangs, groups, organizations? I wasn't part of a gang, but however, my brothers were, they're, and my whole entire family, they're from the Conte Mara Tortilla Flats. I never got courted in, but I was associated with them. He said Tortilla Flats? Yes. So you grew up in the city of Compton, no. or you grew up in uh, Southgate? No, I grew up in the city of Southgate. However, they have a subchapter there in, in Southgate. Oh, I wasn't even aware of that. They actually have a tortilla flats out there in uh in Southgate. I know they have another one out there in the uh, Hawthorne, I think it is. No, not Hawthorne. Yeah, um... yeah they have one in Hawthorne. Is it Hawthorne? No, they do. Uh, Torrance. I'm sorry. Torrance. Torrance. There you go. Torrance. There you go. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, Torrance. Torrance. Right, right. Yeah. But well, you know how gangs are. They they get uh, a spread around, you know? Right. Okay, so I'm the youngest of two eldest brothers. And my brothers, uh, it's a well, well, a big gap between us. My oldest brother, whose name is Jose, and goes by the uh, trouble from Turquia Flats, Travieso. He is 12 years older, my senior. And then my other brother, which was Marvin, uh, that goes by Bugsy, he was uh, 11 years my senior. So by the time I was the age of five, uh, that's when I noticed my brothers were in a the gang. They started giving heavy tattoos, and this is before all these new little mumble rappers, the face tattoos, and this like before all that was popular. Like back then, to have a face tattoo or a head tattoo, you had to really be with it, you know? So that was like when I started noticing my brothers were in gangs and they started having face tattoos and and um, they started like uh, getting locked up in and out, in and out and stuff. And I was like, I was five years old at the time. Which one of your brothers was it that, which one of your brothers was it that got his first face tattoo? And how did your family interpret that? Do you remember your mom's reaction uh, of them getting them face tattoos? Yes. Yes. I was uh, five years old, and my oldest brother, Jose, he must have been 14 or 13 at the time. And it started basic, you know, the simple three dots under the eye, and, you know, and then they went a little, it started getting a little bit more aggressive with uh, flats over his eyebrow, whatever. And my mother's reaction was she was angry. So what she did was she grabbed a knife, put it in the stove, like in the comal, so the knife got red and she was going to burn the tattoos off his, his his body, you know? This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. So it wasn't a good reaction. But as a kid, me seeing it, it was like, oh, man, you think it's cool, you know? Like I said, uh, that's when I noticed we were getting to gangs and stuff. And as a kid seeing it, I gravitated to it because... Um, I seen the reactions they were getting, like how they had, constantly had a lot, like a group of girls at the house, uh, how uh, the attention they would get. is like they'll get locked up, and as soon as they get released, it's like they used to uh, um, reward it with a barbecue all the time, you know? So as a kid, seeing this, it's like you gravitate to it because you're like, man, I want the attention they're getting, you know? So um, so when I was uh, five or... Yeah, well, this all this happened at the age of five, right? That's when... Everything started going sour. So even though it was a complete household, and by that I mean my mom and my dad were married, happily married, and my two older brothers were at home, that that complete household started becoming a broken household because my brother uh, Marvin, he got a, arrested for an attempted murder for trying to kill a rival gang member. And he got, I want to say, uh, he got somewhere like around eight years at the age of six. I was six years old. And my brother was 14 years old or 15 years old, somewhere around there. So that was a big effect because that's the first time we got separated as a family. So my brother had to go to prison or YA or whatever he went to. And um, and that took a big effect on my mom because I remember as a kid just having to see my mom cry like that. And then 
my older brother at the time, my oldest brother, Jose, he started running the streets wildly. Like, he'll never be home. He was constantly on the streets and um, constantly in and out of juvenile hall. And I remember as a kid, like, seeing my mom and my dad, like, sitting at the at the porch, uh, not the porch, at the living room, and it'll be 2, 3 in the morning, and they'll just be right there waiting, waiting, waiting for my brother to go home. And it's like, it was, uh, it was, it was pretty, it was pretty, uh, pretty traumatizing as a kid to see all that. Yeah, and then, uh, so at the, so my brother, okay, when I was five years old, I remember my brother, right before he got busted for the attempted murder, my brother, uh, Marvin, he got shot in the neck. He was almost paralyzed by a rival gang, uh, which was, uh, the Futon Pyrus or the Tree Top Pyrus, one of those. And, um, I remember that was, uh, I was a little kid, so I really know, I didn't know what was really going on, but I remember seeing him at the hospital, and uh, they had him in the gurney or whatever, and he had like the neck brace, and I just remember uh, the doctors telling my mom that he could have been paralyzed. So it, it was a chance of him being paralyzed, and thank God he didn't get paralyzed at the time. And um, and yeah, and then at the time after that, my brother ended up getting shot in the leg, my brother Jose, and then... After that, he ended up getting stabbed, and he started going through a lot of a, uh, a lot of war battle, I guess you could say. Do you remember? Do you remember your mom, um, like actually trying to talk to you guys or trying to talk to your brothers, like, "Hey, Calmenton, like, you guys are going to lose your guys' life on the street, like, like, stop what you guys are doing," or was there any type of conversation like that? Well, this is the crazy part. Around that time, when my brothers were actively involved in the gangs. I remember my parents, and mind you, I was a little kid, but as an adult now, I could I could, could uh, recall the memories, but my mom, mom, I remember them buying funeral plots, because they really thought my brothers were going to get killed at the time. So they, they bought uh, the funeral plot, the, you know, the property for the, like the dirt, the few, you know what I'm talking about, right? The funeral plots? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, people pay them in advance, you know, to be able to be buried next to yeah, their yeah, loved yeah. ones. And, Yes, so, yes. So I remember in the nineties, my my parents started looking into into buying a funeral, and that was that was fucked up. Yeah, that was for 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 a mom to think, oh, my son might get killed, so let's buy this in advance, you know. And then um, I remember too, uh, I must have been five years old uh, when the house got drive by. That was pretty uh, pretty rough. It was a uh, um, my brother was coming home from a party, and. Uh, and for some reason, I remember my sister-in-law coming first, like running to the house first, which is my brother's uh, baby mom, which is my niece's mom. And um, I remember she came into the house and she was like, like beat up bad. Like she had like a busted eye, busted lip, and she was just real, real, real beat up. So I remember my sister-in-law came running to the house, and my mom, my dad, and and myself running downstairs, and asking like, hey, what happened? What happened? And while I was talking to her, I see my brother running in to the driveway, and then on the next house over, somebody chasing them and shooting them at the same time, and shooting at them. And, man, so that was, like, the first, like, I, I was five years old at the time, so it was, like, that was, like, the first time I seen, like, uh, gunshots and, and uh, somebody, like, well, my brother's pretty much trying to get murdered in front of the house, in front of my mom. And then there was a moment, too, where uh, one time me and my dad rode up to the house, it was my dad, my mom, and myself, and we're coming from the auto parts. And uh, when we're walking into the house, uh, my dad was doing mechanic. So he had all his tools out, whatever. So right when we're walking into the house, the first thing we see is a lot of graffiti, like on the on the actual house, like written on the walls of the house and on the sidewalk, on the driveway and all that. So while my dad's walking in, some dude's walking out, my dad's like, hey, man, that's my tools. So the dad handed over my dad the tools and he's like, hey, like, what are you looking for? Like, why are you in my house? Like, oh, well, we're looking for your son, so we're going to kill him, which was my oldest brother. So my dad uh, confronted the guy, whatever. They started, like, a little conflict, a little banter back and forth. And I remember the guy pulling off a gun on my dad and putting it in his face. And um, I really thought my dad was going to get shot that day. And my dad told me, like, why you bring that gun? Well, he didn't tell me. He told the person, like, why you bring that gun out for? Like, I know what a gun looks like. Like, if you're going to pull out a gun, is to use it. So if you're going to kill me, go ahead and kill me. He says, but don't be bullying that gun just to show it, like, because it takes a man to pull the trigger. And my dad tell him that, like, must have really the dude up because he just walked away. But that, that's, uh, that's, 
that's all that started happening when my brother started getting back in. All those negative uh, actions was was a result to their gangbanging, to their selfish acts of gangbanging. The thing was, okay, when I was in uh, elementary school, right? Because, you know, like when you go to elementary, it's like a little area you go to, so pretty much everybody's growing up around the same area. So when I, when I grew up in the section of Southgate, it's by Alameda. So, so the left side is Watts, and then to the right side is LA, right? South Central. So more or less everybody where I grew up had like a similar lifestyle like um because it's a it's a it's a messed up area you know by design it's it's the the ghetto parts you know so pretty much everybody uh was going through like eight having brothers gangbangers or having their dad sell drugs or whatever the case may be right so when I was in elementary it was uh somewhat normal to find oh yeah my brother here from a gang or or like to see uh kids dressed in gang or or whatever so once I hit junior high school these are kids from all over Southgate. So you got kids by the parks that live closer to Downey and Paramount and to the southeast, which were a little bit more um, more well off, like more um, uh, more family organized, more family orientated, and whatnot, right? So when I was growing up and having gang member brothers or whatever, I thought that was the norm. I thought everybody's brothers gang bang. I thought everybody's uh, um, brothers had tattoos. I thought everybody's brothers were in jail, you know? So when I got to junior high school and I would go to uh, little friends' birthday parties or whatever, and I would see their brothers and see their brothers as normal, like as jocks, as squares, whatever, I like that. Like, where's your brother that gang bangs or where's your brother that's in jail? Like, it was it was a uh, shell shock to see, like, wow, like I'm different, you know? Like my my family's not normal. So that's when I kind of started noticing that that that. Like I said, my family was different, but that was around that the time of junior high school where it started affecting me now. Like, damn, man, like, uh, my family's a little bit different than your family, so now I feel like I got a story to prove. Now I got to feel like I got to live to the legacy of my brothers. So now I felt like I had to be down. I had to be the one to go in and, uh, and, um, and make a point, you know? So so that, that, was, uh, that was pretty rough there. Go ahead, and go ahead and proceed, man. Like, go, go, go ahead and proceed w- yeah, with your life how, story, man. Until you got older, until yeah. how you caught your case. But uh, you right. said your brothers caught life sentence too, sure. right? If you want to go ahead and break it down, um, right. did they yeah. catch life first or did you catch okay. life first? Yeah. Okay. I'll, yeah, I'll get there. So, okay, for sure. Okay, so in junior high school, like I said, yeah, yeah, like I said, in junior high school, it was, um, it was just, uh, it was to the point where, okay, my mind already got altered. At this point, like, I went from a kid to how am I going to prove myself? How am I going to show show that, that I could be like my brothers, you know? So it started as a normal high school. It started off as a normal childhood. Like, you know, we go through the little skating era, the, uh, the little skating phase, and, you know, just being a normal kid, drinking soda, chips, whatever. But as a, so junior high school was a uh, – at junior high school, I was actually a good kid. I was a very good kid because my mom used to talk to me, and she could tell me, like, be, be a, the the – the big quote that my mom used to always tell me was, be a leader, don't be a follower. And she used to always tell me, like, hey, you got to be better than your brothers. you gotta, you got to succeed. Because, uh, mind you, my brothers were 12 years my senior, so there's a big gap. So I grew up seeing my mom cry. I grew up seeing my dad cry and, and whatnot. So at a point, it was like, man, I don't want to be like them. I want to be a leader, and I want to be myself. And I had, you know, aspirations. I had dreams of being a lawyer. I had dreams of graduating high school. I had dreams of... Um, of owning a car, I had dreams of owning a house. I had all these dreams, right? So, so at a point when I started getting to high school, I seen like the difference. And then, my, regardless of anything, my oldest brother Jose, even though he was an active gang member, he was very active in my life still. And he used to like try to avoid me from joining gangs and being in the in the that lifestyle in the streets. So he used to. Um, he used to like uh, push my mom to sign me up for sports. He used to, uh, I, I used to, I was, I was always into music. So my brother used to go out of his way to buy me karaoke machines, buy me beat makers, buy me the software to make music. And um, he was a very, he was a good brother. I, I gave him that, and and keeping me away from the streets. So he was, uh, he'll take me out on the weekends to go see movies. 
you're taking on the weekend to nice restaurants with Black Angus, Sizzlers, uh, uh, and all those little nice restaurants. And, and uh, he used to keep me out the streets. He used to keep me real active with his family, which was his son and his daughter and his wife. So at this time, when I was 14 years old, my brother Jose was arrested for kidnapping. So when he got arrested for kidnapping, he ended up getting eight years in prison. So from one day to the next, I had my brother that came me out of trouble to my brother leaving. So it's like, damn, what the fuck? I, I got nobody to guide me no more. So even though he was a bad example, in a sense he was a good example because he didn't want me to live the life that, that he lived. But once he was in there to guide me and to help me, that's when I started going that route of like, okay, fuck it, I'm going to be like that. You know, let me join them. Let, 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 me, let me be like these guys, you know? So, um, so that's when I started messing around. That's when I joined the tagging crew. And because my brother left, I had no brother no more. My brother was my role dog. He was my role model. He was keeping me good. Like, even though he was being a, a bad person, he was keeping me doing good, you know? So once he left, I, I seek that brotherhood again. I seek that acceptance and that, that uh, big brother. So the first thing I did was join the crew. Like, okay, maybe these guys could fucking uh, give me that family support that I want. And that was one of the biggest mistakes because it was a gateway into leading me into the life of crime. Because once I joined that crew, it was from tagging on walls to stealing cars, to gradually robbing people, carrying knives, carrying guns, carrying uh, uh, the little Dodger bag trapped with electric tape, you know, like, and jumping people for no reason, for no apparent reason, like, oh, man, that guy's from that crew or whatever, oh, let's go jump them, or, you know, like, and then it was out hanging each other, like, uh, like, oh, um, oh, we're going to go steal this. Okay, if you're going to steal it, I'm going to rob somebody. So it started, like, trying to outshine each other, and because of the legacy of my brothers, because everybody knew who my brothers were, like, oh, that's trouble and Buffy's brother, I felt like I had those shoes to feel. So it was very hard trying to outshine my brother, so I felt like I always had to do the, go the next step and buffer my homies. Like, like, um, like I said, like, if, oh, he's going to go steal, I'm going to go rob. He's going to stab him, and he's go shoot him. And that's how it started transpiring, and that's how it started snowballing into the life of crime. So... At this time, my brother Buzzy, he was, uh, like I told you, he was like, uh, well, I never told you guys my brother Buzzy. My brother Marvin, he got arrested at the age of 14 for an attempted murder. He tried to kill somebody at the corner of the house. He shot him in the stomach. So he got eight years because he was a juvenile. So he gets out of he gets out of prison at the age of 23. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. At the time, he was cocaine. So... He got busted for selling the rock, and they stretched him out. They gave him, like, like uh, 12 years or something like that because of uh, possession of cells. So from that, he went to prison. And um, and the, the so uh, my, my brother Marvin, I, heard, I never really knew him because he got sentenced to the eight years or whatever when I was for the attempted murder when I, was, uh, when I was four or five years old. So I never got to see him. So then when he got out again, he got out when I was, like, like 11 or 12 or 13, somewhere around there. And then he, he was only out like a month when he got busted for the rock, for, for selling crack. So when I see my brother Marvin again, and when I got to know him, when I went to prison for my murder, and we were selling in Kern Valley State Prison at level 4, 180 yard. And that's when I got to meet my brother, and that's when I got to know him. And um, it's just a trick that I idolized him so much, and then once I got to prison, it's like, like man, like, <laughs> it was just, it was just, uh, like, um, like a whole 180, like, damn, man, like, I went in from wanting to be with my brother to being with him in prison. And it fucked up as it sounds, it was my goal as a kid. Like, man, uh, I hope one day I get to be with my with my brother's in prison, and it happened. So, you know how they say, like, you could do anything as long as you set your mind to it? I set my mind on the wrong things. Like, as a kid, it's like, okay, I'm going to go to prison. I can do this, I'm going to do that. And I did all those things. To what price? Like, to end up getting life in prison, which was, <laughs> which really wasn't really worth it at all, you know. And I remember as a kid, um, you know, like to be like, uh, like, oh, like yeah, you gotta own a house to be a man, or you know, you gotta um, have a good job to be a man. My thing was like, as a kid, was um, man, you gotta go to prison to be a man. To become a man, you gotta go to prison. And that was one of my mindsets back then. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. So what happened, my brother got out of, uh, okay, my brother, I'm telling you, my brother Jose, he went he went to prison for kidnapping when I was, um, I want to say like 14 years old. So that's when I told you that um, 
my life, like even though he was a gang member, he was keeping me out of trouble or whatever. So when my brother went to prison, that's when I started fucking around. So I became a good kid, like a good, like a straight A student from one day to just and going nuts and wild the next day. And it took an effect on me because when my brother got busted, my grades started going down and all these things started happening. And my parents, they're hard workers. They always had two jobs at a time. So I was constantly left alone at my house. Like um, my mom will go to work in the morning at six in the morning and then she'll get out of work and then go to her second job. So I would never see my mom at all. And then my dad, the same way, he had his job, so I would never see them. So the house was empty at all times. So I pretty much got to do what the fuck I wanted. And my parents had this vision of me that I was this good kid that oh, I'll stay home and read books and literally they know I'm out there running the streets and going wild. You know, so so that's how I went from, from being a good kid one day to being a bad kid next day, you know? So um so my brother gets out of okay, so at this time, um the time passes by, I drop out of school and then I end up going to a continuation school. So when I get to continuation school, this is the first time I'm kind of a late bloomer. I started like at 14 and you know I started doing at like 17 or whatever but all this gradually happened when I started going to continuation school so and all sense people like oh it's peer pressure to do drugs or whatever for me it was to fill a void and to numb all that pain that I was going through because it was a traumatic lifestyle to live through all that as a kid so I to numb everything that was going all the loneliness all the, the all those bad things you know all, the, uh, all that trauma so at 17, I got out. Doubt I got out. I started hallucinating because I was up for like two weeks or whatever. And um, I had a girlfriend at the time. And went nuts and and uh, I started pulling out knives on people like an idiot. So I ended up getting a county lead for that. I I got sentenced to a year, which is a felony. They gave me a strike for it. I was 18 years old going to going to court. And to be honest, I didn't understand what the hell was going on in my court. All I know is my lawyers would tell me something like, brainwashing you to go home. Like, you just want to sign anything to go home. So they told me, hey, uh, if you sign this deal right now, you're going to get a, a year county lid. You're going to go home, and everything is going to be a smack on the wrist or whatever. But a little bit, I know they carried a felony. They carried a strike. They carried probation. But I was in the world of this. And I think the system up in a way like that, they can explain things to kids. So but that's a whole different story. But so, um, so, boom, I go to the county jail, and then my brother gets out of prison. So when I get out of county jail, my brother's already out of prison, and he had tattoos or whatever, but this time when he gets out, he looks like a walking billboard, like a newspaper, basically like an L.A. Times newspaper just written all over his face, his head off. So it was like, damn, what the f-? So when I get to see my brother again, all that, him trying to keep me out of trouble, I just went out the window like, okay, you're up. Uh, I'm going to show you how to be a So So the first I'm going to buy you a gun so you can protect yourself. And so... It just got corrupted. So I was still hanging out with him, and I don't know, I just wanted to show myself that I could hang on his level, that I was worthy of, of me being along his side. So I used to try to do the stupidest things just to get his attention, and he never told me, like, hey, don't do that, don't do that. But I can't blame it for, solely on him. It was my fault, too. So when he got out, um, that's, what, that's what transpired to me, taking the life of another person because I wanted to show off as easy as that. And it's all fucked up, but that's just the way it was that my You have 60 seconds remaining. Okay, okay. Yeah, so, um, okay, so mind you, uh, I just barely got out the county, right? I had barely got out the county jail. I was 18 years old, and my brother was 28 or 29. So he barely, so we both barely get, he gets out of prison, I get out of jail. And we're here at the same time, and like I said, at this point it was me just trying to show off and, and show myself that I was worthy and that I could hang. So this is where my case, it's kind of hard to talk about it, and um, man, like I just don't want to sound like very morose about it or anything, but this is my mindset at this time, so I'm going to go back to that time, but I don't think the same way I do now, and and but I'm not giving in detail. So, so we're at a party at Whittier, my brother and I. And um, at this time, I'm hanging out with my friends, and I'm 18 years old at the time, and I'm. this is my mindset back then, how much stuff I was 
I was kicking in with like 13, 14, 15 year old kids to this dude that grew up with. But I'm trying to influence them too. So it was just me being low life influencing these young kids, man, fucking up their heads, eh? Like, and getting, man, dude, I got so much guilt for that and so much remorse for it. Because I just think about how many of their lives I fucked up, you know? Like, and, and man, I did that for them. But so, uh, so I started my little crew, whatever I'm kicking with all these kids, and all these kids look up to me, you know. And every day I try to show up to them, like, hey, you guys want to drink beer? And I go do beer runs for them. And it's with them. And at the little school, I go over there and I beat them to death. And it was just like, I don't know. I felt like I felt like a responsibility to look after them because they're my little homies. But it was just me corrupt fucking heads. Eh? And I had a girlfriend at the time too. And and Man, if she's listening, I apologize for her too. Like, I'm sure I fucked her life up too because she was a good girl and she actually wanted to do was hang out with me. And I got her to start weed. I got her to drop out of school. And man, it's fucked up, eh? But so, um, so what happened? Oh, yeah, so we go to a party. So me and my brother. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. We go to a family party in Whittier. And my little homies are constantly fucking hitting me up. This is back then in 2006, uh, seven. you know, before the smartphones. It was a uh, boost mobile. Uh, remember those chirp phones? Like, brr, brr, like, where you at? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I know exactly <laughs> what you're talking about. Hey, hey, hey Jonathan, yeah. hey, just, hey, just one thing yeah. I forgot to tell you, my boy, are the cuss words. I have to edit them out. Sorry about that. I should have told you yeah. that. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Don't even trip. I, I'll, edit them. I'll edit them. Don't the even worry about interview. it. But yeah. it sounds good though. It sounds good though. Shorts, bro. I don't uh, even trip. Yeah. Don't even trip. I'll, wait, I'll edit them out. Okay. It, it'll sound good. Yeah. You... Okay, okay. Right, okay, go, so, go ahead and proceed, my friend. Right. So I'm telling you, so, okay, so, yeah, you influenced all these kids in a negative way, you know? All these kids that influenced them negatively. So, um, so me and my brother are at a party at Whittier. And um, my little homies, they keep hitting me up, like, hey, bro, we have a party over here in Southgate on Devo Street. And, um, like, oh, show up. There's a lot of females. There's a lot of girls. There's a, it's cool. We got mouth tanks. We got beer. We got this. We got that. We got this. We got that. So I'm very excited now. Keep wanting to go to the party. Like, hey, bro, do me a favor. Take me to this party. Take me to this party. Like, nah, man, it's a little, little kid. Like, I'm sorry about that. But my brother's 20 years old, like, and he doesn't want to go in to, excuse me, he doesn't want to go to a party where there's nothing but but uh, high school kids, you know? So, but I keep uh, coercing him, like, hey, man, please take me, please take me, please take me. And he doesn't want to take me. So I brainwash him at home, hey, man, uh, take me to this party. Your homeboys are there. All your little homies are there. Your homie Shadow, your homie so-and-so, so-and-so, so-and-so. So when, once he hears that, my brother's an active gang member. Once he hears his homies are there, and once he hears the name, like, oh, damn, there's Rose, boom. So that's why I coerce him to take me to that party. Because I wanted to go to that party real bad. So, boom, we get to that party. And as soon as we're hitting the corner, um, we see a group of people. And in the court documents, it says that we gangbang on them. I don't remember that. I'm not even from a gang, so why would I gangbang on them? But it says that my brother jumped out the window and gangbang on them, which is impossible because he's driving, so I didn't see. But that's neither here nor there. We both have our side of the story. That was their truth is their truth, and was my truth is my truth. But I'm not here to dispute that because I already got convicted for it. So... So we get to the party, and I see my, one of my friends named George that they used to call Annoy back then. So I see my friend Annoy, and I get out the car, and I ask him, like, hey, what's up, bro? Like, and the party was raided already, so the party was completely over. Like, what's up? What are we going to do? Like, man, the party just got raided. The party's over. So he has a little buddy next to him, and I'm just looking at him. And to show off in front of my friend, I swing at his friend, like, trying to knock him out, like, just being a jerk. So I try to knock this dude out. And um, he moved out the way or whatever. He's like, damn, what the hell? Like, why are you tripping up my homie? So I was already pumped up, you know, the adrenaline, the testosterone, and trying to show off in front of these my little homies that I cross the street and I see a group of people. And for no reason, I go up there. And just to show up to my brother, too, I go up there and I tell this dude, like, hey, what's up, man? What's the party? And the dude's like, what? Like, who are you? And I punched him in the face for no reason, just me being drunk. So, boom, I punch him in the face. So I start fighting this guy. So out of nowhere, my brother jumps out the car and starts rushing these other, like the, the group right next to that person. So it becomes a, a full-on rumble, um, like eight against two or whatever. But I'm the one that initiated the fight. I'm the one that went in there looking for trouble. It's not their fault. They're just defending themselves. 
So my brother goes and uh, takes off his shirt like, hey, this is Keith, your head's gang. Starts gangbanging on him. But he's, he's doing this to scare them off because we're losing the fight. We're getting outnumbered. We're, we're getting beat pretty bad. So my brother yells out, hey, man, go to the car and grab the gun to back everybody away. Like a little scare tactic, right? He never had a gun that day. So my brother's like, hey, man, go in, go in the car grab that gun. So all you guys back away. So I run for the car, and I did have a knife. So boom, I got the knife. So when I turn back around, I see my brother getting jumped. So I run, and I stab the dude that's beating up my brother. I stab him in the neck, right? And um, the rest of it is somewhat of a blur, but I do remember details. It's like, it's like a little flash. Like, like there's parts I remember, there's parts I don't remember. And from reading the transcripts, it kind of, like, uh, refreshed my memory on it. But I cowardly started stabbing random people. Cowardly. And I say cowardly because it was a cowardly act, right? So I started stabbing all these people for no apparent reason. And um, so my brother's getting jumped. I stabbed this guy in the neck. And then so I'm running back to the car. And Manuel Pascual, which is the, the person that unfortunately – and I regret to be killed that day, is trying to close the door to stop me from leaving. So when he's closing the door, um, I push him, and I stab him in the stomach, I believe. And when I stab him in the stomach, he's trying to defend himself, and he's trying to push me away, but I keep swinging at him crazily. So I stab him, I think it was six times in total. And um, so he falls over. So... I get in the car, my brother gets in the car, we back up, and we catch into a pole. So we're leaving, and I, we see Manuel on the floor, and because of my mind state back then, I tell my brother, yeah, I'm good, thank you. I tell my brother, hey, run him over. So my brother tries to run him over, we hit his impala car, and um, and we get stuck again, and people are reaching into the, to the driver's side and to the passenger side, trying to put the car in park. And I start stabbing again like crazy while people are in the trying to reach into the car to stop us. And I start stabbing people on the arms and, and different parts of the body. So we leave. Boom. We somehow make it out. So from there we go to, um, to one of my brother's friend's house. We go to his house and um, we explain to him what happened. Like, hey, man, this, 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 and that happened. So like, oh, we'll park my car and, and park your car in my in my driveway, whatever. So he parked his car in his driveway. My brother starts picking the fingerprints, whatever. I grab the knife, I put it in the house, and I bury it. The knife, right? So, um, which was never found in trial. But it doesn't make no difference. I still, you know, it still happened. But, so we take off for that night. And instead of going, like, being regretful or whatever about it, we go back to the scene. And we look, and we see that yellow tape. So by that point, we knew somebody died. So then from there, we go to a bar, and we bought, we went to the abandoned house, and we started to smoke, right? So I go home, I go home at the time, and then my nephew's in my bed asleep, or playing PlayStation, I can't remember, but my nephew's in there. So I keep looking out the window, and I see the, the, the police, like um, the gang unit or whatever, I see them peeking through my driveway or whatever, but they just left, like they didn't even, they didn't even do nothing, they just, I guess they were looking for the car. So they go, they leave, boom. So then I walk out my house, and like at 2, 3 in the morning, I'm walking around the street. And um, so I'm just walking around, like uh, smoking cigarettes, being a tweaker. And then I go back home, whatever, in the morning, we leave to, the, to a lake, a Lake Yucaipa and, and uh, the Inland Empire. So when we're at the lake, we get a phone call from one of my neighbors. And, um, and they tell us, hey, man, there's all kinds of cops at your guys' house, you know? So um, we start investigating. And sure enough, they're looking up for us for that murder. So while we're in, in Lake Yucaipa, me and my brother were like, damn, what are we going to do, bro? And they're like, man, well, what could we do? What could we do? So I had family that lived in, uh, in Mexicali, in Mexico. So uh, family started making suggestions, like, oh, you guys should go to Kansas. You guys should go here. You guys should go there. So um, it just, we decided that we're going to go to Mexico. So we stayed in an abandoned house in the city of Beaumont, or Banning, somewhere around there, in the Inland Empire. We're staying in the abandoned house for a few days, maybe a week. And um, we're living in the abandoned house with no running water, no 
Nope. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. So from there on, my grandmother and my godmother take us to Mexico to my grandfather's house. So we get to Mexico and uh, we, told my, we told my grandpa that we ran somebody over and that we need to stay there for a, for a few weeks because that the cops were looking for us. So um, we stayed there for the total of three months. So when I got to Mexico, this could have been a wake-up call for me. Like, when I got to Mexico, it could have been like, okay, I'm going to change my life. You know, I messed up my life. Uh, I'm going to go a different route now. I'm going to I'm a, um, I'm a change what I did, you know? But I did it. I went out and I started running even more of them up. I started going over there. Uh, over there, I tripped out of Mexico because out here in the States and in Cali, whatever, you give somebody $5. This back then when uh, before it was legal. It used to be that backyard boogie, that stress and all that, right? So back then, you used to give somebody $5. They'll give you like a little nickel sack. Well, over there, when I got to Mexico, I gave somebody $5. They gave me a big old garbage bag. Like, that, what the hell? But it was nothing but uh, that backyard, like, nasty big old stems and seeds and stuff. But the point is that instead of changing my changing my lifestyle and changing everything because I just did the, the worst crime somebody could do to another person, I go out there and I keep doing the same crap, man, the same damn thing because that's how lost and broken I was. So we're in Mexico, and I become a full-blown alcoholic three months straight. I'm drunk as hell, doing coke like a vacuum and smoking like a chimney, yeah, popping pills left to right. So one day, me and my brother at, at, um, at my grandpa's house, and ironically, we're watching the movie Thelma and Louise, where it's about the two females are in the room for a murder. So me and my brother, they're watching TV, and, and I hear the ghosts, and I hear the roosters, and everything going wild. It's like 2 in the morning. So what the hell is going on? So boom, 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 boom. I hear a big old knocks at the door. I'm like, damn, what the hell? So my grandpa goes to the front. And he lives like, what the hell? There's a gang of uh, people with AK-47s and rifles. You have 60 seconds remaining. Don't open the door. And the first thing he does is open the door. So it was a Mexican uh, FBI, which is the Aussie or something like that. And they went to arrest us. I'm about to call you back, bro. Okay. All right, thank you. Yeah, so we get to them. Um, so, boom, they knock at our door. And it's a Mexican FBI, which is called the Aussie out there. Right? So, um... As soon as they get us, the police over there are nothing like American police. Where you have your rights here, and you know you get handcuffed, and they put you in the cop car, and they put your head down nicely, so you put your head on the on the on the cop car or whatever. The first thing we do right there when we get handcuffed, they slap the the crap out of us. Like as soon as we get handcuffed, like, hey, what's your name? We lie, slap the crap in the face, kick them in the stomach. Like, damn, what the hell? So boom, we're right here. Uh, the cops are asking us nicely for our names. We're lying to them, and they're beating the crap out of us. And so we got to the point where, man, screw this. I'm drunk, and I'm running for murder. Because they beat you up so bad that you want to admit the truth. So so they they take us to um, to the Mexican jail out there in, in, in um, Mexicali, which is called Caracol. It's like in the, the center of Mexicali. So they take us to the Mexican jail. Um, they're beating the crap out of us, and then the lieutenant or some high-ranking officer or sheriff or whatever he is out there in Mexico talks perfect English, comes and talks to us, and tells us that we're wanted for murder, like a special wanted for murder, and uh, um, uh, the, the marshals will be here to pick you up soon. So somehow, some way, we're trying to convince them into, hey, man, well, we got money. My parents got money. Like, the sub will pay money for you guys to let us go and stuff. Like, nah, like, it's not about that. It's about justice, like. You guys did a crime, you guys gotta go pay for your crime. And we're somehow trying to convince them into letting us go. So, so, um, so we're right there for a while. We go to that jail, which is horrible, horrible jail. It's nothing compared to the States, like, at all. Like, you're literally using the restroom, you're trapping in the damn floor, basically. Because it's toilet, so no plumbing, no water, nothing. So, you just, you go urinate there. And just the water of your urination, the your urination hitting the the, the feces that it brings the odor back to you, like disgusting. I never never experienced something so nasty in my life. It was horrible. So we're right there, and and at this point, I'm just hoping and praying that the U.S. Marshals come pick us up. It's to the point where I ah, screw America and I hate this country. So 
I'm an American. Please take me back home. Right? So the U.S. Marshals come pick us up, and they're asking us, like, hey, man, what you guys do? And this and that, this and that. And, like, oh, you know, for a murder. So, um, hold on, sorry. I think the cops. Oh, because the gang unit just uh, got here right now, the uh, correctional officers. I guess somebody overdosed as we speak. That's crazy, right? So, somebody literally just overdosed. I, 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 damn, that's crazy, somebody bro. Literally, somebody literally just overdosed as we're speaking right now. Well, that's what I'm assuming. There's a lot of fat. But anyway, so, um, okay, so, uh, so what happens, um, and just like that, we're okay, just going to so, continue so, so, so. on. Isn't that crazy? Is, is it? Hold on, just, just to bring up a simple point, man. I feel like society has gotten desensitized, man. Because just like that, we're about to pick right. up and continue on where we left off. It's like nothing. And someone is literally right. probably dying right now. That's 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 sick. That's that's crazy. Yeah. But it's real, fuck, it's real life. Excuse me for my language. It's real life. It's real life, man. And it's, it's horrible that it's horrible. Like, I don't know, man. I feel like. As a nation, as a country, I feel that we could do more, you know, about this, uh, about this crisis, about this epidemic, and it's just crazy how it's becoming a norm. Like, like okay, like for example, this guy just overdosed right now, right? But I know the odds of him uh, dying are very low because of the Narcan and all that. But it's just because there's Narcan doesn't make it okay to go ahead and keep uh, using and and dabbling with these drugs when it could potentially at a point take your life or or affect you mentally, you know, like. Oh, see, that's horrible. what it is. It's, it's, the, nar- it's the Narcan, brother. It's the Narcan. That thing, that thing is right. like God. It literally saves people. Literally, right. Narcan has saved thousands right. of people out there from dying, bro. It's it's a good thing, but it's also a bad thing because right. people know that they can go to the deep end and, and perhaps get saved before right. they pass. And you know what? And and that's part of my journey. That's part of my journey. And here in prison, well, all this transpired. And from a simple mistake that I made as a child at the not a mistake that I made at, from at five years old from when my story started. Then my brother started gangbanging at the age of five when, when I was five years old and my brother started gangbanging and I started getting affected by drugs. I, too, overdosed at the age of 28 off uh, an overdose here in prison where I was there for eight minutes. But it just shows you how one simple act that my brother joined the gang where it led me, where it led all the way to me overdosing at the age of 28 in prison. You know, but that it goes further down the line, but... That happened to me while I've been in prison, and it's something that I feel I need to address because it's something people need to see about our system and, and how one simple choice, um, one simple mistake, I'm sorry, one simple mistake could lead to so much. It's no, it's called a ripple effect, positive, negative, whatever. Every single choice has a ripple effect. So if you choose to do something, it's not going to only affect you. It's going to affect the next person, and it's going to affect generations. So by my brother joining a gang, it affected generations because not only did it affect me, not only did it affect my parents, it's now affecting his children. It's now affecting his grandchildren. And it's probably going to affect his grandchildren's children. You know, because my niece had to grow up with a father in prison serving life. You know, and and now and now my nephew, which my grand, my niece's, my niece's son, he has to have a grandfather in prison for the rest of his life. You know, and then who knows how that's going to affect him at the age of five? Who knows how that's going to affect him at the age of ten? He comes to visit me in prison, and I'll share pictures with you guys of my nephew, my niece, and everything. But you'll see, like, who knows how that's going to affect them, you know? It could affect them in a negative way. It could affect them in a positive way. It could affect them in a way where, man, I don't want to go through what my uncles and my dad and my grandfather and so-and-so was going through. And because I'm to become a lawyer to give justice. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. It could affect them in a way where, wow, I go see my grandfather in prison. I go see... I'm going to do the same thing that they're doing, you know? And we just only tank ourselves what's going to happen from that. But that's the ripple effect. It's just a little yeah. insight, you know, to, to the state, man, at this point, right? So the, shit, the marshals pick us up. And as soon as the marshals pick us up, it was a female marshal. And she tells me, like, hey, man, you guys disgust me. She tells me and my brother. You guys are disgust. Like, you guys disgust me. Like, you guys are what's wrong with society. And, like, and my brother gets real offended. I don't care. I'm a kid at this time. At the age of 18, I don't know what the hell is going on, you know, bro. I'm, I'm still a kid. I'm an ignorant kid. I'm an ignorant, selfish, uh, self-centered kid at this time, right? So she's telling my brother, like, hey, man, you're, you guys are scum. Like, how are you going to kill your own rasa? Like, like, you guys are disgusting. Like, why would you do a crime like that? And I see her passion now, man. It's, it's horrible, you know? 
but at that time, like I said, I was just very arrogant. I told my brother, you know. But um, so boom, so we get to a we get to a, a police station called Walnut Police Station. So when we're gonna get off the car, the U.S. Marshal is right there arguing. Uh, this call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. She's talking negatively to my brother, whatever. So I take my brother off the car first. So the first thing the marshal tells me is, hey, man, you got to pin this on your brother. Your brother is responsible for this. He's the one that lets you to do this. And he's doing this. Like, you know, just blame your brother for it. And um, even though I'm the one that did the crime, in a way she has the scent, she has, she has the, she has the right, the right advice, I want to say, because yes, I'm the one that did the crime, but in reality, my brother's actions to to do the, led me to do the crime, and like explain the ripple effect, but that's, that's just a little here and there, but just, I'll get back to the point. So boom, so we get back to, um, we get to the station, and um, the uh, Detective Cochran, he was the homicide detective. He, um, he takes me to an interview room, and um, they start asking me questions and stuff, and I didn't want to, I didn't want to waste your time, so at the gate, I told him, like, you know, I apologize for you guys driving all the way over here, but I don't got no statement for you guys, and I don't have nothing to say, you know, and, um, and people got to keep that in mind, like, if you ever get arrested or whatever, uh, you really do have the right to remain silent, you don't have to say anything, and don't say anything, because anything you say will incriminate you, so that's just a little food for thought, even if, just, whenever, like, the cops pull you over and they want to interview you, whatever, just, no, I want to speak to my lawyer, because they could switch their words in so many ways. So, um, so they interview, so they interview me, whatever. Um, I have nothing to say. Boom, boom. So they do the same thing to my brother. He has nothing to say. So we stay at the Walnut Police Station for, um, for um, I want to say maybe, uh, maybe five days. I, I believe so. So from there, um, as, as I told you, when I was in Mexico, I was drinking for three months straight, uh, drinking a, uh, um, be a lot of beer, a lot of hard liquor, and doing. So my body was just exhausted. I went there and I slept pretty much those, the whole time I was there. So boom, from there we go to um, to a Downey, to Downey uh, Municipal Court. And they read our charges. I see my mom there for the first time, like in a long time. Um, and I see my family there, man. And I just seem like the pain, like, like just like other, like, uh, I just don't worry. And my dad's uh, face and my mom. And I see my nephew on my knee. And, um, yeah, man, it was rough. So from there, we from from uh, from court, we go back to the we go to the Los Angeles County Jail. We get booked, and they put me in high tower. And high tower at this time, right in the county. This is before the county is now. Like I heard the county now is real nice. You get radios and stuff. And back then it wasn't. Back then they used they used to call it like the flashlight treatment. Like like you get busted in the county, you disrespect the CEO. They're taking you to the side and they're beating the crap out of you. I mean, not a CEO, a sheriff. Los Angeles Sheriff. So even though in Mexico they beat the crap out of you, uh, it, like the, I mean the crap, the way you get beat up in the county is nothing compared to Mexico. But back then in the county, like in 2006, 2007, you used to get beat up pretty bad too by the by the sheriffs, you know. And uh, they used to have these things when when I was right there and uh, and the level it was called level eight back then. When you find murders and stuff like that, they put you like in a like in a high like a high control place. So like where they have like the hardcore criminals, I guess they label it. So it was like little pods. They were like prison pods. But in the county jails, usually always dorms or like um, a lot of freedom. But when they had us right there, it was uh, like isolated, secluded, like kind of like solitary. So what the, the sheriffs will do is like they'll let the trustees, the call trustees, the people that pass out lunches and stuff, they'll let them in and they'll pop our doors and they'll make us fight each other, like just for their thrill. And then the seals, the, no, I'm sorry, not the seals, the seals are here. The sheriffs will give us free lunches. Like, hey, like go out there, fight that guy if you beat him. We'll give you guys two lunches, like, like that was their kick. Like they used to get a kick out of us beating the crap out of each other, you know. And and thinking of it now, that's that's inhumane, you know. Like these are guys that are supposed to be protecting us. These are people that are supposed to be protecting us to serve and protect. But yeah, they're in there in jail, getting a kick out of us beating each other up and and coercing us to fight each other, and, like if we're animals, eh? Like it's horrible, man. The people that that are supposedly the model model people for society are in there acting like criminals themselves, you know? So anyway, so um so I'm going to court and um 
the whole time I'm going to court, I'm just very arrogant. You have 60 seconds remaining. Damn, this time goes by so fast, dude. Okay, right, right. So we're in um, so we're going to court at this time, right? And um, and I'm going to the to um, county municipal court. And this whole time it's like uh, I don't know, it's like my mind was was blocking it or but I, like. I had no concerns, like, I didn't care, like, I knew I was going to get sentenced to life, but to me, like, the whole thing was just a joke, right? And it's very selfish to think that, and it's very irresponsible to think that, because for me, it's a joke, and I'm going through this, and I'm not, I'm not accepting reality. Well, my parents out there are putting a second mortgage on this home. Well, my parents out there are selling little things and that, and collecting money from all the family to pay our lawyers. And here, me and my brother are being asked, and excuse my language, and here my brother... Me and my brother are being idiots out here in the county, uh, doing the same things we kept doing in the streets, man. I kept getting high in the county, kept getting drunk, and just doing dumb crap, eh? And so, oh my God. So we get to, um, we get to, um, so from municipal court, they dropped a murder case on my brother, believe it or not. They dropped it because he didn't commit it. I'm the one that did the murder, so they dropped the case on him. So from municipal, they found us over to Superior Court, which is sort of going to NOAA Court, and they refiled for the for the murder of my brother, so they just refiled, basically, right? So we're going to court for two years. We finally go to trial, and um, and when we go in a municipal court, it's called a preliminary hearing. When we go in a preliminary hearing, they're calling victim by victim to go get their statement. So we're right there. We're sitting down, and um, they, call a, they call one of the victims up, and instead of the victim going up, Manuel, Manuel, the person that unfortunately died during the whole, the person I killed, I'm sorry, I can't say that, the person I killed, that I very regretfully killed, his sister got up and went to the stand, and she wasn't a witness. She just went up there on herself, she picked up a chair, and she threw it at me, and she cussed me out. Why'd you kill my effing brother? Why? Why'd you kill my effing brother? And to this day, I just will never forget those words, I'll never forget this call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. Like, the damage I put it through. And again, at this time, I'm thinking it's a joke, like, <laughs> all funny games, right? But now that I think about it as a doll, like, and I, and I see it now, I replay that memory, like, like, it's just horrible that I put somebody through that pain, you know? Like, they're like, what if that was not one of my nephews or whether that was one of my nieces, you know? And... And I regret not taking it more serious back then. And I'm very regretful now and, and I'm sincerely, sincerely, sincerely like remorseful for that, you know? To put her through that pain. Because imagine the nightmare she went through, imagine all the heartache she went through and Ah oh, man. But yeah, so so we get to um we get bound over to Superior Court. So once we get bound over to Superior Court, um we're facing uh we're going through the little motions, we go to trial. Um, the victims had to be lived through everything, and um, and I'm being arrogant again. I'm being arrogant through the whole trial. I'm staring at the victims. I'm mad bugging them. Um, every time they, excuse me, sorry for my language. Every time they say uh, like, oh yeah, he's the one that stabbed my friend. I laugh about it. I giggle at them. I smile at them. Like intimidated them. Um, being arrogant, man. And uh, so, um, but and which is my mindset, then you know. So. So, boom, so, um, so we get found guilty, right? We go through the whole trial, we get found guilty. And, um, and so the, in the ending, they, when the judge, they ask, uh, the victims or the families or anybody has anything to share, you know? So, uh, the sister went up there and she read a poem about her brother, you know? And she expressed, uh, how much she meant to her family and, and how much, um, how much they valued him, you know? And he was a human being, bro, like, we're the same age, you know, and I chose my route in life, and he chose the right route, you know. He was living like the way he should have, and he was going to college, and he was doing everything right, and I stole that from him. I stole his future, and and who knows, he could have been a father by now. He, there's so much he could have done, and, and I took that from him, and I look at my nieces, and I look at my nephews now, and it just makes me like, man, like, what if somebody were to do that to them, you know? And I did that to somebody, and to just know that I put somebody through that pain and that, you know that I took somebody's life, it's like, every day, man, it's a, it's a 
horrible reminder, you know. And but so anyway, so um, so um, and that kind of shook me there. Hold on, let me let me compose myself real quick. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Take your time. Yeah. Right. So okay, so the sister asks me like, like um, you know, my brother got killed, whatever, and. As you being the responsible, she she is looking at me like as you being the responsible one, Jonathan. Like you don't want to take my brother's life. Like I ask you, like, and I'm asking you, like, why'd you kill my brother? Like, please answer me that question. Why'd you kill my brother? And she's staring at me, and she asks me, and the judge looks at me. And and my reaction was, "F you, you stupid B word," you know, like, and that was my reaction, bro. And Man, and if I could take back time now, like, there's so much I would have done different, and there's so much I would explain, but I was just, I was, man, I keep saying that I was, I was sick at the time or whatever, because I was, bro, it was just a messed up, uh, but it was just my upbringing, man, I wasn't, I don't want to say, I don't want to say that I was just, I don't want to, because I don't want to make excuses for my actions, because what I did was wrong, and nothing would ever justify what I did, and no matter how much I explain it or whatever, it's never going to bring him back and it's never going to justify what I did, you know? But I could honestly 100% say, say that I was just messed up at that time, man. I lacked love. I lacked respect. I lacked um, I lacked uh, responsibility. I lacked remorse. I lacked empathy. I was uh, I was antisocial, bro. I had antisocial personality disorder, you know? I was um, I was a sociopath. I could, I could honestly say that at that time. I was a... I was a social type, bro. I had no no regards for anybody. I had no empathy. It was just me. I was just self centered, you know. So, so boom. So um, I get sentenced. I get my sentence of 81 years to life. You know, I go to um, I go back to the county. And, uh, I'm bragging for everybody. Oh, I just got life. I got life. Laughing about it. And um, uh, and boom, I go to prison. I hit reception. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Well, we're in the county and. Well, we're going to try on all this. Uh, one day I'm in the court tanks. And I'm in the court tanks, and for the very, very, very first time at the age of 19, I tried at the court tanks. Um, some guy from Watts offered me, like, hey, man, you want some you want some black? That's what they call it, black, right? Some snack? You want some black? I'm like, nah, I've never done it, bro. Excuse me, excuse me. Nah, I've never done it, bro. I've never used it, you know? And tells me, nah, I just like but better. I'm like, wow, let's try something, you know? And I tried it for the first time, I didn't like it. But eventually, later down in life in prison, I, at a point, I got a bigger, you know, I got strung out. And um, so, um, so boom, so we hit prison, we go to reception, me and my brothers are selling. And right when we get to reception, my brother's goal is like, is, excuse me, I'm sorry again for my language. My brother's like, screw this, bro, I, I'm going to make myself something like this. I'm gonna take this serious. Like I'm a, he he his mindset was on some. I don't want to explain too much because of because of our policies and prison politics or whatever. So there's a lot I can't really detail. But his whole mindset was like, uh, I'm gonna live the American me lifestyle, you know. So so to this day he's stuck in Pelican Bay, my brother, because of that, you know. He's, he's in Pelican Bay State Prison right now and. For what it seems like he's gonna be there for the rest of his life, you know. But um, so yeah, so I get to reception at, at this time too. So, again, I'm acting arrogant. I'm still immature. I'm still being a jerk. I get to uh, I hit a level four 180 yard. That's like the worst yard you could hit uh, in prison. I'm 19 years old. And I get into a 180 yard, and um, or 20 years old or whatever, and I get to a 180 yard. And at the gate, they hand you a knife. You know, same for yourself. And me not being from a gang, it's like I had to prove myself a little bit more. So it was like, okay, I'll do this, I'll do that, I'll do this. And, you know, I ended up in the shoe three times. Uh, you're familiar with the shoe? The security housing unit? It's like the whole but worse. You ever heard of that? Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Uh, 23 and 1. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, so what I ended up in the shoe, right? And, um, I ran into Charles Manson while I was in the shoe, which is pretty crazy. Yeah, I got to see him before he died, you know? So, um, I was in the... What was that shoe, like? Uh, <laughs> meeting Charles Manson? 
he's an angry, he's an angry, odd little individual, that guy, man. Uh, so I was in the shoe, and uh, they had, like, a special housing unit, I guess, like, for the serial killers and the high-profile people. It's like they're not PC'd up, but because of their fame, they have to put them in a special unit. So when we're in the shoe, they have their own little block, which is fenced off, and they get their little yard right there or whatever. So um, when we're – back then, uh, the shoe, they used to put you in – they're called dog kennels. They literally put you in a, in a cage, a 2 by 9 cage, and that was your yard. And every day for two hours, you go to a little cage. And it has a little toilet, and everything's just open. The whole cage is open. It's just a fence. So you get to see those – you see them going to visit. You see them going to medical and stuff like that. And we used to see Charles Manson. They used to push him like, to uh, visit or medical, and he always had a little guitar. And one time I went to medical, he sang a song for us. And, uh, but he was an angry man. He was a real racist. Like, uh, he'll pass by, like, hey, screw you, and go back to Mexico and then to the black people. He'll, he'll use derogatory terms on them. And, <laughs> he was an angry individual. I think he ever, I don't think he ever learned his lesson, that guy. But. Your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. You have a prepaid call. You will not be charged for this call. To accept this call, say or dial 5 now. Thank you for using Global Tail Link. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I was telling you, like, um, once I got up the shoe, that's where my rehabilitation started. And, um, and that's where my journey began, you know, like, to do better and... Uh, I can sincerely say that uh, although I'm in prison and can't say like uh, prison was like a good thing or whatever, but I could say that it, it saved my life. And in reality, like, you know, they say blessings come in disguises. I can honestly say that prison was a, a blessing to me, you know, because it made me aware of of the cycle that's in my family and uh, all the wrong that's up there in the world, you know. And my goal is, I know I can't change the world, like, completely, and it's impossible to think that, but I know uh, person by person, I can make a difference, you know? And hopefully with this with this little podcast we got going, or this little interview, I mean, um, I hope together we can make, uh, somebody hears this or somebody, somebody's inspired by this, that, you know, like, none of this was worth it, bro. None of this was worth it. You're, you're sitting in a, in a cell suit by name that's, you have you sitting in here like an animal, bro. Um, you you crap or you eat. you crap or you eat. You know you get fed in your cell, and then right when you get fed, the toilet's right there, right next to you. You have to shower with other men. Um, you're confined. You're controlled by everything. You're, you're told once to flush the toilet, because you can't even flush. Because when you flush two times, the toilet locks on you. So you gotta control your flushes. Every day you're told what to wear. Um, every day you're told what to do, and it's. There's no, there's no uh, freedom here, you know. So, um, it's hard to have a, a word that wisdom is that every action, every single action in, in life, comes with a consequence. You got to think about what you do every single time, because you never know what that action will lead to. Because every thought, every thought you have, every situation leads to a thought, and then from that thought, it leads to a choice, and then from that choice, it leads to an action. So every time we're in a situation. You gotta sit back, breathe, and think about the outcome. Because there's an outcome to everything. And if it's like you ever heard that saying, What would Jesus do? I, I live by a saying by the three P's. Is it powerful? Is it productive? And is it positive? And if I'm in a situation and I ask myself, Is this gonna, is this actually gonna be powerful? Is it actually gonna be productive? Or is it gonna be positive? And if all, if one of them needs to know, I won't do that. I won't do that thing. Because I know there's gonna be a Dire consequence behind that. So, just think twice before you do things. And even though if you messed up already and you're on the journey to to becoming new, and they say you take two steps forward and one step back or whatever, like, oh, this guy just takes two steps forward, two steps back, whatever. But if you're taking ten steps forward and you take two steps back, you're still eight steps ahead. So even though you have a little fallback or a little thing, don't beat yourself up for it. Cause you're, uh, regardless of anything, you're still ahead in life. And as long as you change and as long as you're sincere in what you believe and what you do, everything's going to be okay. And I just sincerely ask everybody listening, any youth, any, any little, at, somebody that's at risk or somebody that's in prison, or, well, whatever the case may be, man, like, you know, it's not over for us, bro. Like, there's still faith, and while you're in prison or while you're going back, just think about it, man. Like, 
none of this is worth it. And you can make a change in and I believe in you guys, man. And anybody listening and that's lucky love or whatever, like believe me when I say that I love you guys, man. Like we we just we just I needed that at a time that somebody to tell me I love you and and the truth is that that I do care about I do care about people and I, I care about about this role man and, and I'm very grateful for what I did, you know. And if I could change it I could, I would and I'm doing that little by little.